back to a course on calculus RS integration. In this lecture, we are going to see a theorem which states that if some function is Riemann integrable on a specified closed interval a, b, and since this is Riemann integral, basically it is a bounded function. So the range of this function is the interval uh, m comma m, m comma big m, and we are having a function which is continuous on the range of f then the composition of these two functions is also Riemann integrable. That is what this theorem is about to tell. Okay, Composition of a continuous function with the Riemann Stelges integrable function is Riemann Stelges integrable. That is what the theorem says. Let us get into the proof of this theorem. Given uh, phi is continuous on the uh, interval uh, m comma m, here we can very well observe that this is a closed and bounded uh, so therefore, we have this phi is a function which is a continuous function on the compact set uh, m comma m. Therefore, it has to be uniformly continuous. If it is uniformly continuous, then what? By the definition of uniform continuous thing for every epsilon and positive, that is a delta positive. And here we are choosing this delta to be less than epsilon. We can choose delta based on epsilon, right? This is some extra condition that we impose in order to prove this theorem. This is not by the definition of a uniform continuity. By the definition of a uniform continuity, what we have is for every epsilon positive, that is a delta positive. In order to prove this theorem, we are imposing extra condition that the delta has to be less than epsilon, such that uh, epsilon condition holds whenever the delta condition holds. Right? Given f is rs integrable, therefore there exists a partition by the necessary and sufficient condition of rs integrability. There exists some partition such that up f alpha minus lp f alpha is very negligible quantity. That is what it means, right? So here that negligible quantity we choose to be delta square, right? You choose it epsilon, you choose you name. Actually, we are just naming the negligible quantity to be epsilon or delta or eta, whatever we like. Okay, here we are taking that to be delta square. That's it. Next, uh, let us take the supremum of f of x in. Okay, here it is given that. Uh, sorry. Yeah, it is given that h is h is phi of f of x, right? So, your f is from a to b to m comma m. This is what we consider. Okay. And this goes to r. And this is your f and this is your uh, phi and your h is what? Phi of f. Which means your h is some mapping that maps from here to here. Right. So, with this, what we have is, we are able to find out the super, we, we have a partition, right? So, that partition splits your interval a, b into subintervals. In each subinterval, we are finding the supremum and infimum of the function f of x as well as h of x, right? So, this is f of x and this is h of x, okay? Uh, and, okay, we have find... Now, we divide this 1 to n into two classes, a and b. The two classes are divided using this condition. If your mi minus mi is less than delta, your i is. These values, these values in this set belong to the class a. If it is bigger than or equals delta, that belongs to the class b. Okay. If you look from, if you look the choice of delta, this delta is chosen in the set m comma m. Okay. So, whatever. Okay. This is chosen in order to satisfy some condition in the closed interval m comma m. But here, the points that we take are in the interval. These are defined based on the interval a comma b. So, that is why it may be less than epsilon or bigger than or equals epsilon. Okay, if it is less than epsilon, for, that is for the elements in uh, A, what is the thing that we are going to have? We have this thing. 
Therefore, we shall consider h of s minus h of t is going to be smaller than or equals absolute of this thing. Whenever your requirement satisfies, this is going to be less than epsilon, right? If you take supremum, this is what going to happen. Okay. Hope uh, you you get uh, the idea of how we get minus m i here from the previous lecture. You can refer. I have explained these ideas in the previous lecture itself. If you have not watched previous lecture, you can go watch it and come back so that you will have the idea of how we got minus m i star here. Okay. If you find the summation this quantity multiplied with delta alpha i, this is going to be less than epsilon multiply uh, epsilon and the again things okay in between we have a thing that is this quantity is less than summation i runs from 1 to n epsilon delta alpha i this is a part of the summation okay here we have n terms here we will have less than n terms so this quantity has to be less than the entire thing so here if you take uh, epsilon outside and uh, you will be left with what epsilon multiplied with alpha of beta minus alpha f a that is okay if you want i can show it i have explained these things in many lectures again let me do it so it is going to be a alpha of 1 minus sorry alpha of uh, x1 minus alpha of x0 plus alpha of x2 minus alpha of x1 and it goes till alpha of xn minus alpha of xn minus 1 your alpha of x0 is nothing but alpha of a and this is nothing but alpha of b and the rest of the terms gets cancelled and we will be left with alpha of beta minus alpha of a. That is what we have written. Right. So we mark this as equation 2 and for the elements in b that is for the class b what we have is mi minus small mi is bigger than or equals delta. Now we are taking since uh, your phi is bounded we take k to be the supremum of phi of t okay then what we are going to actually this is supremum of absolute only then we will have uh, the supremum and infimum in the sub intervals will be smaller than or equals that k so this gives us that m i star minus small m i star is less than 2k and we mark this as equation 3 and we are going to sweep squeeze this result into these things okay what we have is delta is okay actually what we had is mi minus small mi is greater than or equals delta and we write this in this fashion okay we just multiply delta alpha i and take the summation over i in b this is what we are going to have so this is less than summation i runs from What less than or equals i runs from 1 to n mi minus mi delta alpha i. Now we can split this into summation i runs from 1 to n mi delta alpha i minus summation i runs from 1 to n small mi delta alpha i. By definition, this is UPF alpha and this is LP. This is this is UPF alpha and this is lpf alpha hence we get this quantity to be less th lesser than or equals upf alpha minus lpf alpha and we have initially taken that this is less than delta square so what you have here is okay let me write here what you have here is delta is a constant hence you may take it outside i in b delta alpha is less than delta square you can cancel delta on both sides and you will have summation i in b summation over i in b delta alpha is smaller than delta and we mark this as equation 4. Now we consider u p h alpha minus l p h alpha by the definition we write this and we squeeze this into things and this can be split into two classes that is whether it is in a or it is in b we split these things if we add it up we are going to get the same right and the first is smaller than epsilon times of alpha of b minus alpha of a and this quantity is less than uh, 2 k. actually uh, this is less than 2k and this quantity is less than delta that is what we have proved using the inequalities 2 3 and 4 we get this one from and you know your delta is 
delta is chosen in a way that delta is less than epsilon when you do delta is less than epsilon what you are going to have is epsilon multiplied with alpha of beta minus alpha of a plus 2k epsilon and when you take epsilon as a common you you get what alpha of beta minus alpha of a plus 2k actually okay so since epsilon is arbitrary this is going to be happen for up h alpha minus lp h alpha is a very negligible quantity then by the necessary and sufficient condition of rs integrability we conclude that h is in r of alpha right now uh, i would like to make a remark uh, which is based on the previous theorem that we have seen that is in the previous lecture we have seen that so ah uh, yeah this is what suppose f is bounded and f is okay here it said it is said that f has only finitely many points of discontinuity and alpha is continuous at all those points suppose alpha is not continuous at one of the points of discontinuity of f then the function is not rs integrable right your alpha may be discontinuous at some other points that is also possible the thing is that alpha has to be continuous at the points where f is discontinuous if f and alpha have at least one common point of discontinuity then the function f need not be rs integrable that's it thank you